Welcome to the latest edition of our C19 Business Recovery Response webinar series. Can we ask that you please keep microphones on mute, cameras off, and we'd like to let you know that the presentation section of this webinar will be recorded. I'm James Lamprell. I work at the University of Kent in the Knowledge Exchange and Innovation Department as a Business and Industry Relationship Officer. We act as a gateway into the university, helping to keep, connect industry with the wealth of expertise that resides within. With over 1,000 academics across 21 academic schools, we can help your business succeed through supporting innovation, creativity, and enterprise. Our webinar today forms part of the HR network, where we run a series of networking events, webinars, a LinkedIn knowledge sharing group, a newsletter, and of course, our annual conference in November. We'd like to extend our thanks to HR Go for sponsoring this year's network. The group MD, Roddy Barrow, has kindly offered to tell us a little bit about the HR Go group. Over to you, Roddy. Thank you, James, for giving me the brief opportunity to speak today. Uh, HR Go PLC is delighted to be able to sponsor the University of Kent and its valuable contributions to the HR network in these unprecedented times. We very much admire what the University of Kent is still achieving in these difficult times. For those of you who don't know HR Go PLC, we are a privately owned nationwide UK recruiter with about 210 staff across 34 offices. Actually, that's 35 offices now as I opened a new office in Portsmouth yesterday, but also with 60 people in Poland and two in Sydney, Australia. We currently have in excess of 10,000 temps working for us, whilst we do in excess of two million pounds worth of perm business each year. We are especially proud of our Kent heritage that the Parkinson family started the business in Dartford 64 years ago, and still the second and th third generations are actively involved and own 100% of the group. Our head office is in Ashford, but we have multiple offices across Kent and the rest of the country. Our investments in technology mean that we have a, our own e-commerce business and have grown the business by 35% in 2020, and we expect to do even more in 2021. If any of you might be thinking of a change of agency, ask to see a demo of our new technology. It is free for clients and we think it is a current game changer, even providing video support to registering candidates. Whilst as a client, you see who is booked to work for you. You enjoy electronic timesheets, easy access to understanding hours, invoiced, and your debtor balance on screen, and a lot more. Do enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Back to you, James. Thank you, Roddy. If you'd like to learn more about the HR Network, please feel free to join our LinkedIn group, email hrnetwork at kent.ac.uk or search for the hashtag Kent HR Network on social media. We have put some links for the group and contact details in the comment section below. During the course of the work webinar, we would welcome your questions, which you can direct message to me or place it in the chat function if you prefer. And these will be posed at the end of the talk. If you are comfortable, you can ask them yourself or if you would prefer, I'd be very happy to ask them on your behalf and I would direct message you to see your preference. Today's webinar is hosted by Dr. Clara de Innocencio from the School of Psychology and is titled Career Callings in the COVID-19 Workplace. Really excited to learn more. Clara, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Let me share my screen. Are you able to see my screen, my slide? Yes, yes. we can, Clara. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So as Jim said, my name is Dr. Clara de Inocencio Laporta. I'm a lecturer in social and organizational psychology at Kent. I teach uh, social psychology, organizational psychology, and business psychology to undergraduates and postgraduates. And I'm going to talk today about the psychology of work and most, more specifically, the psychology of vocational callings. Um, and how the pandemic has changed the way we view our, our work. Um, as a psychologist, uh, work is a topic that I've been drawn to because it is a source of great joy for some people, um, but also um, enormous alienation and pain for others. Uh, work can also be uh, traumatic in its absence, but when we think about why people work, the naive intuition we have is that uh, all people care about is um, themselves is making a lot of money or gaining status and power. Our idea of success is very self-centered. Um, how many goals did you hit or what grade did you get or how much money do you make? Not um, who did you help today 
or how did you make a positive impact on other people today? And we really have this incredibly simplistic view of um, why people work. And one of the things that we really want from our job is that they feel meaningful. And you often hear people say, you know, I'm not satisfied with my job. It pays okay, but it's, it's not meaningful. I feel like meaning is missing. And I think ultimately what we want from our, from our work or through our work is to help other people. I think that although conventional economics uh, presents us as simply selfish individuals out to maximize our, our, our income, what we really want to do or a secondary very powerful drive we have is to help other people. Um, and now that, that doesn't mean um, becoming a doctor or a nurse or saving the developing world. It could mean something like, you know, removing the squeak in a door or reuniting somebody with their lost luggage, but a feeling by the end of the working day that we've somehow left people better off than they were at the beginning is an absolutely essential part of what makes work meaningful and a, and a, a working life fulfilled. Our motivations to work and uh, um, how we derive meaning from our labor is unbelievably interesting. I've been studying this topic for several years now, and I just find it very, still very engaging and poignant. So I want to tell you about that. So um, in this webinar, I will briefly go over the COVID-19 workplace and the challenges that it presents us with. I will then spend some time talking about the psychology of vocation and calling, including unhelpful myths of calling, the bright and dark sides of calling, and the search for calling. I will also discuss the concept of job crafting, and I will also spend some time talking about the science of motivation and engagement at work, trying to debunk some of the myths and intuitions we have about what gets us up in the morning. And I will end up by highlighting how knowledge of these topics can help businesses. So the pandemic has radically changed how we work, and let's face it, working from home is hard. The boundaries between our work lives and our personal lives have become blurred because we sleep and live in the same space where we work. Also, most of the satisfaction that we derive from our day to day work comes from our in person interactions with others. And now we lack that type of social connection. And that's a situation for people who have had the fortune of keeping their jobs. Um, unemployment has quickly emerged as a, as a crisis within the crisis. Redundancies are at record levels, and these numbers are higher for the self-employed. So the crisis is providing us with an opportunity and an obligation to think or to rethink how we work. One of the questions that has been uh, on our minds um, lately is what really matters, what really matters to us, um, where we find meaning, our relationship, our relationships. The research shows that um, countless individuals are having a what am I doing with my life sort of moment. Um, the pandemic has almost been a global opportunity to reflect. And that's really key, especially in the Western world. We're always running to the next thing. We don't give ourselves much time to reflect. So this situation, the pandemic, is giving us a little bit of time to reflect. And some of those reflections have led many people to to realize that their job isn't really what they wanted, that their work is not meaningful, it doesn't fulfill them. We really spend a lot of time at work. We spend one third of our lives at work, another third of our lives sleeping. And the remaining third is the time that we have for leisure, which includes all our social and family activities, physical exercise, travel, hobbies. And nowadays in the prosperous world, we don't only expect to obtain money through our labor, we also, to a greater or lesser extent, expect to find meaning and fulfillment. The idea that work may be fulfilling rather than just painfully necessary is a strikingly recent invention. The desire to do meaningful work is more prevalent in the millennial generations and younger generations than, than in any generation before. So people are increasingly expecting more from their work than financial rewards and promotions. In addition to the monetary rewards and career advancement, people are seeking occupations that will provide a fulfillment of core personal values, um, purpose, meaning, opportunities for self-expression, opportunities to help others. So in short, people in a wide range of work contexts and occupations are not only looking for a job that sustains them, they're also looking for a job that they love, that fulfills them. So if you look at it ideally, what would we like work ideally to be? 
three things. Uh, first of all, it should be about service to other people. I think that there's no greater joy in being able to serve somebody else. And often the concept of serving is seen as insulting. Oh, somebody wants me to serve them. But it's the great joy and all good work, all noble work is service, is human serving other humans. But of course, there is something else. Uh, you need to be able to locate that kind of service, which is most attuned to your own distinctive character. We want to see ourselves in the most precious bits of us in our work. And that's why there's no one kind of satisfactory work. There's no one kind of satisfactory service. For some people, service may mean making bread for other people. For others, it may mean delivering ideas for other people, whatever it may be. But we're always trying to externalize what's precious in us, um, stabilize it in some form, because the other ambition behind work is to create something that endures, something that is a little bit more solid than we are ourselves as vulnerable uh, flesh and, broad, and blood uh, creatures. The concept of impacting others in, in a positive way, in a way that goes slightly above and beyond our physical fragility and our temporary nature. So for most of human history, work has been uh, a drudgery. Uh, the notion that you should love your work was not operative for most people. It was just a route to an income. And there was a certain liberation from that, I think. You didn't have to ask yourself every minute of every day, is this work fulfilling my deeper aspirations? Uh, you just got on with it. So we have built a more ambitious world uh, to dismantle that world and go back to an earlier world, which had a certain freedom from those anxieties because of a lack of ambition. Uh, realistically, I think that's not a route open to us. We need to have the intelligence of our ambition um, but put in place strategies that will more reliably help us to bring about the ambitions that we have. In the world of work, that means getting a lot more intelligent about career guidance, about the process by which people find their ways into a job. Um, and this is a lot of the work that I've done in my PhD. Let's keep the ambitions we have, but let's build a scaffolding that we're going to need to get up to the top of those ambitions. So before I dive into the psychology of vocation and calling, I wanted to briefly mention the parallels between love and work. We tend to write a lot and think a lot less about work than love. It has a lot less glamour, but in terms of importance to our lives, it's just as important. And it's got many of the same complexities. In both love and work, we're looking for recognition. We're looking to be understood. We're looking to make a difference and impact uh, on others. And there's a lot of the same causes of frustration, failures to communicate, failures to work well with another person because we're not on the same page. Um, our partner is generally the person in the world most able to destroy us. And work is that to some extent as well, maybe less vividly, but Work can create a real sense of pride of who we are, a sort, of, a sort of identity in the world, and it can also be the destruction of us in some way. Um, the reality is that it's very hard to marry the right job. It's uh, hard to marry the right person, and it's perhaps even harder to marry the right job. The first question that satisfactory and fulfilling work uh, confronts us with is, who am I? Because uh, only on the basis of understanding your talents, your proclivities, your interests, do you have any chance of knowing where you want to make a difference? And that can take an awfully long time. Um, most careers don't allow you to date. They don't allow you to nibble and taste. They force you to commit. And once you started up a, a track that may not be right for you, heaven forbid, because you may be living in an expensive side of town. You may have accrued obligations to others. There may be children. And how are you going to reverse out of that uh, in order to find a more authentic and, and fulfilling work? So it's heartbreaking sometimes how many people have things to contribute to humanity that they intimate uh, in the evenings or on the weekends. They know that there's something that they should be doing, but they lack the, the wherewithal, the courage, the know-how to extract this precious gold and, and refine the golden nugget which they are capable. So ever since I've been studying the psychology of work and callings, I've been asking everybody how they feel about their jobs whether they like them or not and i meet quite a lot of people who feel that they don't have any specific talents and they don't enjoy the work they do that much they don't enjoy their working lives that much they kind of uh, get on with it and wait for the weekend but i also meet people who absolutely love what they do and couldn't imagine doing anything else and and if you said now, why don't you stop doing this and try something else for a change? Uh, they wouldn't know what you're talking about because they'd say, this isn't 
what I do. This is what I am. This defines me. Uh, when I do this, I am in my most natural and authentic self. So psychologists have put a name to this. Uh, they have identified three distinct ways in which people can view their work. People can see their work as a job, as a means to earn money. For people who see their work as a job, their primary motivation to work is the paycheck at the end of the month. If they were financially secure and if they didn't need the money, they would no longer continue with their current line of work. They would rather do something else instead. Second, there's people who view their work as a career. These workers are more invested in their work because they expect to get more from their work than just the money. Uh, for people who have a career orientation, their primary motivation is to advance their careers, to gain status, to gain promotions, recognition, power. Um, sometimes their work seems like a waste of time, but they know that they must do sufficiently well in their current positions in order to move on. Uh, they don't plan to stay in their current jobs for a long time. Instead, they plan to move on to better, higher positions. And finally, there's people who view their work as a calling. For them, um, work is one of the most important parts of their lives. Um, their primary motivation is not the salary and it's not career advancement, but the meaning and the satisfaction that they derive from the work and the positive impact it has on others. They feel good about their work because they love it and because they think it makes the world a better place somehow. So for people who view their work as a calling, work is an end in itself. It's not a means to earn something else. So you may wonder how many people have the luxury to view their work as a calling. Population estimates suggest that these three work orientations are quite evenly distributed among the, in the population. Around one third of workers see their work as a job, one third see their work as a career, and approximately one third see their work as a calling. It's important to note that although these orientations are helpful as a general distinction between work approaches, they overlap to a certain extent. For example, most people wouldn't do their work if they weren't paid, but for people who have a calling uh, orientation, that's not why they do what they do. And interest in the concept of work as a calling is clearly increasing. In recent years, we have seen a wave of research on work as a calling in the organizational psychology literature. And this growth coincides with a generational trend towards pursuing meaningful work and living out one's calling at work. This graph, uh, which I generated in Google Ngrams, depicts the frequency which was the, which with, um, with which the phrase work as a calling appears in Google's uh, corpus of nearly one, one, 190 billion uh, words from printed English language texts between the 1900s and 2019. So as you see in the graph, the concept of work as a calling has risen considerably since more or less the start of the 21st century, and it continues to rise. And in fact, the steepest rise appears to be just in the past two decades with usage frequency skyrocketing between 2000 and 2019. And the calling orientation has also become particularly important during the pandemic. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has recast how many people think about their careers. Um, um, it's uh, having a, a, an impact on a growing number of people across countries and industries who are deciding to make uh, transformational changes to their careers, switch sectors, change companies, retrain, or even set up their own businesses. There's a renewed interest in spending one's life doing work that is fulfilling and, and meaningful and contributes to the world in a more direct way. And of course, the tendency towards, uh, the, towards more purpose-driven jobs, towards career callings was well underway, but the pandemic has accelerated it because the shift to working from home has played a key part. It has stripped away some of the things that used to boost uh, job satisfaction. Even people who thought that they had dream jobs before the pandemic are reflecting on what these amount to now that they're working from home. While we may be attracted uh, by the perks of a job like travel or a very high salary or a plush office, these can be distractions masking the more significant meaning that we get from our work. So what constitutes work as a calling? It has three main components. First, it is deep, deeply meaningful and purposeful for the individual. And this is a subjective experience. So what may be meaningful to you may not be meaningful to another person. Even two people who have the same job, um, the same position may assign different meanings to that work. For example, 
a hairdresser may think that she simply cuts people's hair to make a living, whereas another hairdresser may think that she doesn't only cut hair, she also empowers people every day, makes them feel more confident in themselves. And there's a lot of psychological power in changing someone's look, um, that, work, that the work she does can transform people's lives in a way. The second component is um, of calling is that uh, the person feels that their work makes the world a better place, that it has a positive impact on others. And again, this is subjective. This means that callings are not inherently moral or ethical work. For example, um, Mother Teresa had a calling probably to help millions of people building hospitals in India, but perhaps Adolf Hitler may have also had a calling to save the German people committing atrocities. So this pro-social, altruistic, positive impact component of calling is subjective rather than objective. And finally, callings in the modern era have lost uh, much of their religious connotation, but they're still often built around a narrative of self-transcendence, of being involved with something larger than oneself. Many people experience callings as a transcendent summons, like an external pull from God or destiny. It may be a family legacy. It may be the urgency to meet social needs. And this transcendent component of calling is also deeply subjective. So these are three items of the calling and vocation questionnaire, and you can check the extent to which you may view your work as a calling by thinking about how you would agree or disagree with each of these statements. If you agree with these three statements, then that means that you may view your work as a calling. So the benefits of approaching one's work as a calling are numerous, and this type of individual purpose is one of the factors that has had a disproportionate effect on employee well-being and effectiveness during the pandemic. A career that is fulfilling can act as a, a buffer against the stress that has accompanied the pandemic, and it can also make workers more resilient in the face of constant change. People with callings um, find that their work is deeply meaningful and has a positive impact on others, which provides a strong sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. Generally, workers and students as well, who view their career path as a calling, have higher well-being, life satisfaction, life meaning. They demonstrate good psychological and physical health. They have less emotional exhaustion. They are less likely to burn out. They also find their work more, regard, more rewarding, more enjoyable, more satisfying. They perform at higher levels than their peers. And they're also more resilient facing career challenges and adversity and failure because they have a clear idea of why they do what they do and, and its value and impact for other people. They're also more committed to their careers, their jobs, their organizations, because their work is an integral part of who they are. So we've established the benefits of viewing one's work as a calling, but I think it's important to also talk about some unhelpful myths people have about what calling is. Um, calling generally answers the question, what is my purpose in life? But I'm actually not a big fan of this question because it implies that there's a single answer, one single purpose for everyone. And the reality is that there isn't one right you. There are lots of good yous. All of us could embark in multiple careers that could be satisfying. They're all in you. There isn't just one you. And maybe uh, you are one of those people who comes up with, um, this is the one reason that I was put on this earth for. This is what I was meant to do. And you get that singularity of purpose. But most of us, I think, aren't wired that way. And if you start with a question that presupposes one right answer, that's kind of burdensome. For example, I'm now teaching um, students, young adults, and sometimes trying to help them find an inspiring career. If you ask me, am I sure I'm doing the right thing? Well, I'm not sure this is the one right thing. I see myself doing other things. I hope I can do other things, but I'm living purposefully. I am growing towards purposefulness. So I prefer the word purposeful than the word purpose. I don't want to burden people with a question of, uh, you got to be doing the right thing. You got to be your best self. No, be a good self, do a purposeful thing, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's also very important to note that a person's calling, a person's passions, interests change throughout a lifetime. That is to be expected. We're living in an era of high uncertainty and in higher education, we don't really know what skills to teach students, what they will need to be employable in the future, because we don't know what kind of jobs the, uh, the future will, will have, will hold. The only skill that we are sure that students will need, we will all need, is the ability to reinvent ourselves, our careers. 
to reinvent our vocational identity, to be in a process of continuous learning. So this idea of finding a career calling once and for all, um, I think is an unhelpful myth. And another thing that I take issue with sometimes is the idea that we, if we feel an absence of calling, that that makes us inferior, uh, somewhat uh, like an inferior individual. And I suspect for most people, we don't have a calling. Um, they don't have something that they've always regarded as their destination. And, and there is some sort of a myth of calling that is unhelpful, which suggests that you will be literally called uh, to a certain profession, or if not, then you have no particular role in society. And I think that's a very misleading story. Most of us don't have a calling, but we do have certain things that will answer uh, very needs within us. It's just that identity is much vaguer, and we're going to have to spend a lot of time digging it out from all sorts of unhelpful notions or confusions. I sincerely believe that there is a job for everybody. There is a service for everybody or several ones um, that is going to work really well for them. Uh, I'm not suggesting that's going to be a very outwardly uh, prestigious or lucrative job. It could be a relatively simple one. It doesn't really matter. The point is that there is something that is going to excite everyone. And I think a lot of us um, are like children uh, in a way at the beginning of the summer holidays. We're a little bit bored. We haven't found our way to the games that are going to satisfy us. And work should be that. It should be a game. It should share with childhood play a sense of spontaneous excitement. And we know from watching children play that games don't need to be sophisticated in order to be interesting. And we're like that as adults. So I'm not arguing for everybody to be an MIT research scientist and, and finding a specific PhD topic. Not at all. It doesn't have to be intellectually very taxing or artistically very skilled. But I think that there is a marriage possible for everyone, uh, which will bring satisfaction. And indeed, there is a bad marriage for everyone that will frustrate and, and humiliate us. So one of the things that I've been really interested in in my research is how people find their calling and how, how young adults experience the quest for a calling. I, I, I struggled a lot when I was younger and I still now uh, figuring what to do with my life. And I felt that the help that grown-ups were giving me was somewhere between useless and criminally negligent, um, which ticked me off and still does. Uh, we don't help people very much to choose their careers uh, when this is one of the most important decisions uh, of our lives. So we know that approximately one third of adult workers approach their work as a calling, but calling is even more prevalent among, ad among young adults, among students, with more than half of university students reporting that they feel called to their careers and nearly 40% reporting that they're actively searching for a calling. And the search for meaningful work can, can happen at all stages of life. And it actually spikes when in impactful events happen, like the COVID-19 pandemic, which make us uh, reflect on what really matters to us. But young adults are twice as likely to be searching for a calling than older workers. And as this is the life stage where people are generally searching for identity and, and meaning and looking for a career that fits and, and gives a sense of purpose to their lives. When you're in university and you are young, there is a sense that you are at the beginning. So you're scripting out the choices that you have ahead of you. But the search for calling also happens in the middle of our lives. When you wake up in the middle and you don't like where you are, even if you have a job that you wanted or if you are in a career path that you endeavored to be in, you occasionally wake up in the middle and discover that you don't like your job. You can't stand your boss. Uh, the way forward is unclear or the thing that you are being made to sell just won't sell and you're stuck. So although the search for calling is more prevalent at younger stages in life, is by no means exclusive of young adults. So one of the things that I've analyzed in my research is what are the differences between people who have a calling and those who are searching for one? Comparing these two dimensions of calling has allowed me to get more insight into the positive and negative sides of calling. So only people who have a calling enjoy the well-being benefits associated with callings. People searching for a calling are significantly less happy um, and satisfied with their lives, and they also find their lives less meaningful. The presence of calling is also related to higher resilience in the face of adversity and challenge. People who have a calling are interested in learning the subject, their calling domain, mastering their work domain. So they see failures as good opportunities to learn how to improve. Uh, they don't take failure personally. Um, they actually seek challenges and, and try to learn new things. 
Conversely, people searching for a calling are less resilient to challenge, and they see failures in their careers, in their studies, in their work as an assault to who they are as a person, as a threat to their self-esteem. They also tend to avoid challenges, and they prefer activities that they already knew how to do well because they care deeply about being judged able and competent, and they're constantly comparing themselves to others instead of competing with themselves and trying to improve their past performance like people who have a calling. But I found an interesting result. Uh, people who had a calling were more likely to be dogmatic and closed-minded, whereas those searching for a calling were particularly open-minded and, and flexible thinkers. So people who had a calling were more likely to agree with these items. My opinions are right and will stand the test of time. Basically, they had absolute certainty that their opinions, their beliefs, their ideas were unequivocally right, and they were not willing to reconsider their assumptions. Conversely, people searching for a calling were more likely to agree with items like, it's best to be open to all possibilities and ready to reevaluate all your beliefs. Basically, searchers had the opposite cognitive style or thinking style. They were unsure about whether their beliefs and assumptions were right or wrong. They believed that flexibility was a real virtue in thinking, and they were eager to explore new and different uh, ideas and experiences. So I identified a darker side of having a calling. People who have a calling are more dogmatic and inflexible in their career choices. They have lower interest in areas outside of their calling domain. They're not interested in learning other things. They are more reluctant to change their career path, even when this is necessary. And they show lower receptivity to career advice, even when this advice is coming from trusted mentors. And these are all factors that can hinder the employability of people. So even though calling makes people more resilient to challenges, it also can be a double-edged sword for employability, especially for younger adults who foreclose too early in their career choices and refuse to change career trajectory. The thing about passions is that we often settle on them when we're young, and the danger is getting locked in. Uh, most of the time, our early passions are not the best guide to our later careers. Uh, there are so many things about the future and yourself that you don't understand yet. You don't know how the future you is going to be like, so it is better to be open-minded and flexible. So the potential problem of having a calling, a strong sense of calling, is um, the problem of becoming too comfortable in a particular area, which is that we become overconfident in our recipe and resist trying new things. This is called the fat cat syndrome. There's a big impetus, especially uh, with success, to repeat whatever has worked before. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But people who are dissatisfied with the way things are, um, are more likely to come up with ideas that really shake things up. And this is the bright side of being a searcher. Feeling unsatisfied with the status quo sparks our openness to experience and our creativity. Research shows that frustration can fuel creativity. Um, consider this um, a recent, uh, recently done study uh, at a company. Supervisors evaluated how often employees brought innovative ideas to the table. The employees who were rated the most creative were the ones who felt dissatisfied with their jobs. Their frustration with problems motivated them to develop fresh solutions. So, but it's important to know that dissatisfaction didn't always lead to creativity. It only helped when people felt committed to their company and they also had access to the type of feedback and support that they needed. So when you ignore uh, disgruntled employees or students, people channel their frustration in unproductive or even counterproductive directions. But if you are aware that they're out there and you really listen to them, they can become your allies. So the take home message here is that if you are lucky enough to have identified your calling, that's great, but beware not becoming too rigid and inflexible in your thinking and your career choices and your interests. On the flip side, if you are currently searching for a career that fits, um, capitalize on your open mindedness and your creativity and be patient. And uh, patience, I think it's really key. Um, in, in my research, I've seen how there are dramatic differences, individual differences between, between people who have a calling and people who are searching for a calling, which suggests that the process of finding a calling may take a considerable amount of time. 
So how to find your calling, how to find your element? One of my favorite books is called The Element by Sir Ken Robinson, which is a very famous uh, educator here in the UK. Um, and he talks about strategies about how to find your element or your calling. Being in your element is a common expression that people use to describe an activity that you're not only good at, but that you also love. And it can be any type of activity, really. And Robinson explains that finding your element is a two-way journey. It's an inward journey and it's an outward journey. The inward journey is to get to know yourself better, what you're trying to find out more about in your life. You need to identify what your aptitudes are, the things that you're good at. Um, and one of the problems that you confront is that we live in cultures with a very narrow definition of talent and it's an idea that has been promulgated systematically through many of our education systems we have a very narrow view of ability in schools we tend to confuse all forms of intellectual ability with iq or academic ability and actually human talent is, is tremendously diverse and multifaceted um, and one of the principles of finding your element is to have a much bigger conception of aptitude and talent and then it's also an outer journey in, in, into the world around us. If you live a, a monotonous life with repetitive experiences, it's unlikely that you will have those new experiences that may trigger a new discovery in yourself. You need to be bold to try new things that you've not tried before and to put yourself to different sorts of tests. Um, you, found out, you find out who you are uh, by acting in the world. You do it a little bit by reflection and contemplation, but mostly, the games are in the world with other people. And I think of the search for calling not as a, as a journey in the conventional sense, but as a quest. And a quest is um, a journey that you undertake whose outcomes are not certain. You set off in high spirits, you set off optimistically, but it's not likely, it's not clear what it will take you, and it's not clear whether it will be successful. Um, a quest is a journey of discovery, and you might find yourself discovering things along the way that you hadn't anticipated. You may find yourself in unexpected places. It's like setting off in the high seas. You may set off with a clear destination in mind, but you may be blown off course. Um, some people may actually sink, but you may end up on some foreign ensure that you hadn't anticipated, which turns out to be a, a much better option than the one you had in mind. And that's all part of, of being alive. Um, life is not linear. We compose it as we go. It's a constant process of improvisation, isn't it? We kid ourselves sometimes when we're writing our CVs and our resumes and and we put it all down in paper, we put key dates in, um, and we make the, the whole thing look like it was a plan because the last thing you want to do is to give the impression to a prospective employer of the actual chaos that you were living through. You want to convey to them that this was a strategic plan that you've been executing faithfully since you were 15. It's not, you're actually making the whole thing up. So life is not linear, it's a quest whose outcomes are not certain. And I understand why uh, follow your passion is, is such a popular career advice. Chances are that you spend the majority of your waking hours at work. It will be a tragedy to devote so much time to something that you hate. But the reality is that many people don't know what they love to do. And even if you do, most passions don't translate neatly into careers. When I got to university, my strongest passions were dancing and singing. I'm not clear how those jobs would pay the bills. Also. Uh, for some people, for many people around the world, passion and work is a luxury, whereas um, income is a necessity. And there's also the question of talent. Um, not everyone can be anything. Uh, parents nowadays tell their kids often that they can be anything that they want to be. And I think this is a bit misleading. Maybe a few of them could be anything they want to be, but the majority can't because we're not skilled at everything that we love or because there are no jobs in that area. So. I think, tell the kids the truth. You could be anything that you're good at as long as they're hiring. It sounds less romantic, but it is more truthful and it doesn't set up people for disappointment. So is passion at work something we should strive for? I think it's a fascinating question because it really speaks to the aspirational meaning that work has received. Never have we expected more from work. We want from work today what people used to get from religion and community, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, meaning, transcendence. Um, that's a whole new set of expectations. And I think it's good. I think it's a wonderful new permission that people have access to this kind of intensity in their work. But what comes with that is the other side of passion, which is massive heartbreak. 
disillusion, disruption, degradation. I mean, passion has its side effects. Um, nowadays, people don't just leave because the company closes. That happens. But this is not the primary thing. People leave because of management reasons, because they were not promoted enough. They were not seen enough. They were not acknowledged enough. And the work that um, Yakimowicz and his colleagues have recently published has been helpful to me to answer this question of um, is passionate work something we should strive for? And what they found is that when people think about passion as pleasure or joy, they're much less likely to succeed in pursuing whatever they thought their passion was than if they think about passion as meaning and purpose. And that's because um, emotions are much more fleeting and a sense of mattering is much more sustainable. What I say to students when they tell me, I want to find a job that I'm passionate about, or I want to love my work, is that I think to me that is something that we can look forward 10, 20 years down the road after you figure out where you find meaning and what kind of contribution uh, you can make. So passionate work as meaning and purpose uh, is something worth striving for. Uh, passionate work as joy and pleasure is setting ourselves up for disappointment. So. Okay, the research has identified the myriad of benefits associated with viewing one's work as a calling. Um, there are also some potential drawbacks, like becoming more dogmatic and close-minded, but overall, it's a positive, a very positive thing. But let's face it, people frequently are unable to work in occupations that answer their callings. Unanswered callings may be more common now than ever before. In recent years, the popular press and the media, organizational scholars as well, have praised enthusiastically the virtues of having a calling. How, uh, and, and they often even go a step further in stressing how important it is to find your true calling. For example, America's uh, two largest job search companies launched uh, advertising campaigns urging job seekers to follow your heart and find your calling. Your calling is calling. So today individuals are exposed to, and they can consider many more occupational choices than in the past. And many young people, many members of the millennial generation and, and younger generations have internalized the idealistic belief that they can become anything that they want to be. But for a significant number of employees, the world of work is structured in a way that restricts their ability to pursue all the occupations that call to them. And, and feeling unable to pursue a calling can undermine psychological well-being by producing a high degree of frustration, disappointment, or regret. And, and this can ultimately hinder job performance. In fact, people who experience unanswered callings report worse um, life uh, outcomes, job outcomes, health-related outcomes than those who don't have a calling at all. And this is probably because uh, they feel unable to meet their expectations. For most of us, happiness is um, determined by the gap between what is happening in my life and what I had in mind. If the gap is large, my life is going poorly. If the gap is small, my life is going well. So what about the people who are stuck in a role that they don't like very much, but cannot leave their job to search for more meaningful work because they have obligations, they have bills to pay. So I want to tell you about one of my favorite studies of all time, which was carried out by Amy Rasniewski and Jane Dutton and, and their colleagues. They interviewed a cleaning crew of a hospital and asked them a series of questions like, how do you describe your role? And what are the tasks in your job? And um, what's the level of skill required to do your job? On the right, you can see the official job description that, of these hospital cleaners. And the researchers found two types of cleaners. One type described their role and their tasks as per the official job description, and considered that the level of skill required to do their jobs was quite low. Basically, anyone could do their job. The other type of cleaner would describe themselves not as a hospital cleaner, but as, as other things, like an ambassador of the hospital. And when they described the tasks in their job, they would describe all sorts of things that were not included in the official job description. Uh, one said that he would stop mopping the floor when patients were out of the beds trying to get a little bit of exercise, that he wouldn't vacuum the floor of the visitor's lounge when the visitors were taking a nap, even though these things were against the rules set by their supervisor. Another one said that she accompanied a, a patient's grandfather who came to visit her every day uh, to the parking lot because he always had trouble finding his car. And this meant that she would leave her post for a few minutes to accompany this visitor every day, which was not 
it was not allowed. Another one said that she uh, rearranged the pictures on the walls um, in uh, of rooms of comatose patients, so they were not really perhaps aware of this, to introduce a little bit of novelty and change in the patient's surroundings and maybe accelerate their recovery. Um, another one said that he who would wash the floor of a comatose patient's room twice or sometimes three times a day because the patient's father didn't see it do it the first time and he was getting angry about that. If you look at the official duties of these cleaners, there's not a single thing on that list that involves all the human beings. Yet many of these cleaners were interacting with patients and visitors and changing the tasks of their roles, making people feel a little bit better and deriving more meaning from their jobs. When this second type of cleaners were asked uh, what level of skill was required to do their job, they would say that very high skill that not everyone could do what they did because they were not sticking to the official job description and, and duties. The hospital cleaners were um, working pretty rigid jobs, but that didn't stop them from taking on tasks that weren't originally part of their roles. This is what the researchers called job crafting. So jobs as designed by managers tend to be uh, one size fits all and not customized to meet the particular needs, motives, preferences of individual employees. Um, typically, a job design is communicated to employees via a written job description, which is usually a static list of tasks, responsibilities, uh, reporting relationships with all employees in the same job receiving the same list. Um, but employees often have a fundamental desire to find positive meaning in their work. And job crafting involves creating or initiating change to the job as opposed to reacting or responding to change in the job. In essence, job crafting is the process of employees proactively changing the boundaries that comprise their jobs. Job crafting is about redesigning your job description. You are job crafting whenever you change the tasks or actions in your work, whether you are adding them or subtracting them or revising them. Instead of just um, accepting a job description that was written as a one size fits all, you customize the job to fit your strengths, your values, your interests. You become an active architect of your own work. Um, and by bringing um, a job crafting perspective to bear, job designs are no longer construed as a static source of uh, constraint or top-down control, but rather a, a starting place or a partially blank canvas uh, from which employees can alter the content of their jobs in ways that cultivate a positive sense of meaning um, and identity in their work. So in doing so, employees can move from a one-size-fits-all job description to an individualized enactment of the job that serves as a source for positive meaning, uh, identity expression, um, both of which are conducive to psychological flourishing and strengthening, and not to mention um, also to higher efficiency and productivity in the job. So job crafters shape the boundaries that define their jobs in three main ways. The first one is task crafting, which involves shaping our role by adding or dropping responsibilities to fit our strengths and passions. For example, an elementary school teacher who has a passion for IT or computer, computer science may spend time learning classroom technology to align her job with her passion or a chef that has a passion for design or an eye for design may take in upon, uh, upon herself to not just serve food, but to create beautifully designed plates that enhance a customer's dining experience. Um, the second type of job crafting is relational crafting, which invo involves uh, changing up who we work with on different tasks, who we communicate with and engage with on a regular basis, and spending more time with individual with preferred individuals, and reducing or completely avoiding contact with others, which we may not get along with well, or we may find are toxic relationships. For example, a salesperson may form a relationship with the engineers in the firm because she gets along well with engineers, but also because it helps her understand more of the features of the product that she's selling, even though this relationship is not prescribed in her official job description. And the third type is cognitive crafting, 
which uh, is how people change their mindsets about the tasks, the jobs that they do. For example, um, a hospital cleaner may see himself as a hospital ambassador because he participates actively in the patient's healing process by coordinating with their nurses and doctors and their visitors, by not only sterilizing the environments where patients heal, but also rearranging the environment and introducing novelty and change and to their rooms that things that could accelerate the patient's recovery. So by changing perspectives on what we're doing, we can find or create more meaning about what might be otherwise uh, seen as uh, futile work. And through one or two or all these three strategies, job crafting can help us redefine, reimagine, and get more meaning out of, the, out of what we spend so much time doing. So a study by Berg and colleagues found that Although many people have passions that they never got to pursue in their careers, sometimes they find small ways to incorporate those passions into their jobs, like a flight attendant who turns boring announcements into a comedy routine, or a, a priest or a rabbi who brings the guitar to the sermon, or the professor who uses magic tricks to get a point across in the classroom. Um, many people who have callings uh, that they were unable to pursue professionally for one reason or another, often take active steps to craft or alter their jobs and also their leisure activities in pursuit of their unanswered callings. The researchers identified three techniques that people use to bring elements of their unanswered callings into their actual jobs. The first one was task emphasizing, which involves highlighting tasks that are already formally a part of one's job to pursue an unanswered calling. For example, a teacher who was passionate about a career in computer animation may try to use technology as much, as much as possible in the classroom. The second one was job expanding, which involves adding tasks to pursue unanswered callings. For example, a communications um, associate who was passionate about being a, a writer or a magazine editor may volunteer to become the go-to person for anything that has to do with communications and writing. The third one was uh, role reframing, which involves altering one's perception of uh, a role to pursue an unanswered calling. For example, um, university lecturer who was passionate about a career in music may liken teaching to being a musician and put on his uh, performance face when he's in front of a classroom. And the researchers also found that some people with unanswered callings are actually perfectly content doing them as hobbies on the side, uh, pursuing leisure and volunteer activities related to their unanswered callings. For example, a lawyer who was passionate about gardening and devotes much of his free time to plant flowers and vegetables in, in his garden. And the outcomes of job crafting are overwhelmingly positive, and in many respects, they are the same outcomes as those of having a calling at work. Workers who craft their jobs to align them with their strengths and interests are more satisfied with their jobs, they're more productive, they're more resilient to adversity and challenges, they're more attached to their jobs and their organizations, and they feel less uh, replaceable than their peers. And these findings have been replicated across different professions, organizations, and countries. Um, researchers have also done interventions where they select a random group of employees in an organization and instruct them to job craft. And this is done anonymously, so nobody in the organization knows who is job crafting and who isn't. After a few months, employees are asked to rate each other in terms of their levels of happiness, levels of energy, levels of productivity. And uh, people rate their colleagues who have been job crafting as significantly happier, more energetic, more efficient. So I think the lesson here is that if you hate your job, if you're not uh, making a living wage, if it's making you ill, or if there's a, a, a bad workplace culture, like discrimination, then you should quit as soon as possible and search for something better. But if you're simply feeling kind of disengaged from your daily work, then give job crafting a try, because that dream job that you fantasize about probably doesn't exist. Um, perfect jobs don't exist. And the research shows that pretty much any job can turn into a calling if you bring the, the right attitude. So if you work independently, uh, you can decide where to bring those core parts of yourself uh, into your job. But um, it's a lot harder if you have a boss who is not on board with your image 
of your job, right? Managers sometimes feel very nervous about this job crafting because it means giving up control. We can't possibly allow our employees to do this. It would be a mess, you know? People would be freestyling and off-roading and doing all sorts of things that would be problematic for the organization. And the response to that is, um, well, this is actually happening. Employees are doing this already uh, all the time, everywhere. It's just that workers are generally hiding this from managers. So um, managers have a choice. They can help facilitate and encourage job crafting, or they can continue to sort of drive this underground with employees who still will take the degrees of freedom they can find to derive more meaning and more of the kind of identity they want to enact in their work in any way they can. And what is the most powerful way to signal commitment to employees' sense of purpose and meaning in their work? I would argue uh, it is to celebrate and support their ownership, their authorship, and their autonomy at work. And I want to talk a little bit more about autonomy and how important it is to feel a sense of autonomy and freedom in how we do our work in order to find it meaningful. Um, we all crave freedom and discretion in how we carry out work tasks. You don't have to give people a lot of autonomy about the ends, about the objectives, if you give them autonomy about the means, about how to get there. This is something that Richard Hackman found throughout his career, that if leaders are very clear about a mission, a purpose, a goal to work towards, they can give people a ton of autonomy about when to do it, where to do it, how to do it, and with whom to do it. And that works out really well. And I think if you really take that view, then giving people that kind of autonomy is an expression of trust. You're saying, I believe in you, I trust in you. Um, I'm going to let you know what the objectives are and, and why I think they are worthwhile. And then you got this, you can decide how to get there. Today, more and more people are working for themselves um, across the United States and Western Europe, there are about 150 million independent workers and the numbers keep on increasing. And even if you work in an organization and you have a boss, you still have to manage yourself. You make choices every day about which tasks to prioritize, who to invite to a meeting, how to start digging out of your overflowing inbox. Um, and being your own boss is attractive in part because we all have a basic need, a basic desire for autonomy. Um, and all of these reasons explain why surveys show that on average, uh, the self-employed are more satisfied with their jobs. An entrepreneur is one of the happiest professions, even if it's also one of the most stressful occupations. And I want to talk a little bit more about the topic of engagement uh, and motivation at work and, and try to dispel some of the misconceptions and, and intuitions that we have about what gets us up in the morning. Being engaged at work means being highly involved in, enthusiastic about, and committed about our work um, and, and workplace. And, and, but according to a Gallup poll from 2020, only about a third of American workers report feeling really engaged with their jobs. Over 50% admit feeling actively not engaged. They merely put up with boring work. And nearly 20% reporting hating what they do for a living. So approximately 70% of the workforce feels disengaged and unsatisfied at work. And this not only has um, significant potential performance consequences, but it's also um, a tragedy that most of today's workforce uh, is an unenthusiastic, uncommitted to the activities that they spend so much of their time uh, doing. Um, so what could make work life better for the millions of people who feel disengaged at work? Many of us have a, a pretty strong intuition here. We would be happier if only we had a bigger salary. Uh, but this is generally not the case. Money and, and bonuses are generally not what gets us up in the morning. Our motivations are unbelievably interesting. The science is really surprising. Uh, we're not as easily manipulable as you may think. Uh, there's a whole set of really interesting studies showing that monetary rewards can backfire when it comes to motivating people and increasing their productivity. And I want to give you a couple of them that call into question this idea that if you reward something uh, with more money, you will get more of the behavior you want. And if you punish something by giving very little money, you will get less of that behavior. 
some researchers at MIT took a, a group of people and uh, gave them a set of challenges, some of which were very simple and um, only required motor skills, and others uh, that were intellectually more complex and required concentration or even creativity. And they gave them these uh, challenges, and to incentivize them, incentivize performance, they gave them three levels of reward. If you did pretty well, you got a small monetary reward. If you did medium well, you get a medium reward. If you were one of the top performance uh, performers, you got a, a large cash prize, which was equivalent to a two month salary. We've seen this movie before, right? This is the typical motivation scheme uh, within organizations. We reward the top, the very top performers. We ignore the very low performers and folks in the middle, they get a little bit. So what happened? As long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as it would be expected. The higher the pay, the better the performance. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. When the stakes are very high, people are likely to crack under pressure, especially when the task is complicated. So large stakes lead to big mistakes. So for tasks that are algorithmic, a set of rules uh, you have to follow uh, and, and get the right answer. If then type of rewards, carrot and stick, outstanding. But when it comes to more complicated tasks, when it requires conceptual or creative thinking, those kinds of, of, of motivators demonstrably don't work. So money is a motivator uh, for work, for hard work, but in a slightly strange way. If you don't pay people enough, um, they won't be motivated, but people don't do sophisticated work just for the bonus. Our motivations are more complicated than that. And the best use of money as a, as a motivator is to pay people enough to get the issue of money off the table. So they're not thinking about money, they're thinking about work. And, um, Another example of this is uh, an experiment by Desi, who was, is a, a slightly different story, but um, he wanted to know what happens if, when, if you start giving people money to do something that they genuinely like doing, then that they would do without the monetary reward. This is what we call in psychology uh, intrinsic motivation, which happens when we perform an activity without expecting any rewards, except the enjoyment that we get from the activity itself. So Desi wondered if a boy who enjoys mowing lawns begins to receive payment for the task, what will happen to his intrinsic motivation? The boy is performing the activity for no apparent rewards except the enjoyment that he experiences from the activity. And our logic would tell us, well, now the boy has two reasons to, law, uh, to, to mow the lawn. He likes it and on top of it, he's receiving payment for it. And two reasons are better than one, right? But what Desi found was that when money was used as an external reward, intrinsic motivation decreased significantly. Once we start paying people to do things that they love doing, we change their mindsets about that activity and they start doing it for the payment rather than for the activity for its own sake. Um, this finding has been replicated across many studies and, con and countries and cultures. When external rewards are introduced, people's perceptions of the task shift and they start working for the money rather than for the pleasure of the activity itself. But there's another side to this. Desi found that if a person is intrinsically engaged um, in some activity and he or she begins to receive rewards in the form of verbal reinforcement and positive feedback, a pat in the back, then intrinsic motivation increases and the person will be even more motivated to keep on doing the activity. This type of verbal rewards and reinforcement is something that we, that parents often use with children, but in the work context, money is used significantly more than verbal reinforcement. There's a lot of power in social approval and verbal rewards. They help us enjoy the work that we do more. So I think it's worth knowing this, uh, a word of appreciation and acknowledgement has a huge effect on our motivation to work hard. So what does the science say? What is a better model of motivation than the carrot and, and stick model? The theory of self-determination is one of the most established, if not the most established theory of motivation in psychology. Um, it was proposed by Desi and Ryan in 2004, and then it was revamped by Dan Pink in 2009. So the science shows that there are three basic psychological needs, which uh, if met, 
lead to greater performance, motivation, engagement, and also personal satisfaction. And these are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is the need to direct your own life and, and work. To be uh, fully motivated, you must be able to control uh, what you do, uh, when you do it, and who you do it with. In many ways, traditional forms of management run uh, foul of that. Management is great if you want compliance, but if you want engagement, which is what we want in the workforce today, as people are doing more complicated stuff, um, self-direction is better. Um, let me give you an example of an almost uh, radical form of self-direction in the workplace, um, which leads to good results. And it's the, the company Atlassian, which is an Australian software company. They do something really cool. Once every few weeks on a Thursday, they say to their developers, for the next 24 hours, um, you can work on anything that you want, the way that you want, and with whomever you want. All we ask of you is that you show the results to the company. And it turns out that one day of pure, undiluted autonomy has led to a whole array of fixes of existing software, a whole array of ideas for new products that otherwise would have never emerged, just one day of autonomy. And this is the sort of thing that um, uh, people that would have not, wouldn't have known before the research. If you wanted people to make more innovative, you would have said, um, give them an innovation bonus, right? No, what you have to say is you probably want to do something interesting. Let me get out of your way. One day of autonomy produces things that had never emerged. Another example is flexible hours. Companies are increasingly giving flexible hours to motivate their employees by increasing a sense of autonomy. One of the silver linings, I think, from the pandemic and working from home is that we all have more autonomy in how we get our work done, uh, when and where we work. And counter to what many people thought, people are not working less, they're working more. So let's talk about mastery. Mastery is the desire to, to improve, our urge to get better at stuff. Uh, we like to get better at stuff. This is why people play musical instruments uh, on the weekends. These people are acting in ways that seem to be irrational economically. They play musical instruments. Why? It's not going to make them any money, um, most likely because it's fun and because you get better at it and that's satisfying i imagine that if you had gone to an economist a few years ago and had said i have this idea for a business model that i want to run past you here's how it would work you get a bunch of people uh, around the world who do highly skilled work but they're willing to do it for free and volunteer 20 or 30 hours a week and then what they create rather than sell it they give it away for free and the economist would have probably thought that you're insane. It seems to fly in the face of so many things. But uh, then you have companies like Wikipedia. What's going on there? Why are people doing this? Many uh, technically sophisticated, highly skilled people who have jobs, they're working at jobs for pay, doing sophisticated technological work. And then during their limited discretionary time, they do equally, if not more technically sophisticated work, not for their employers, but for someone for free. Um, that's a strange economic behavior. Why are they doing this? Um, it's overwhelmingly clear. It's as challenge, it's mastery, along with making a contribution. And, and let's talk about purpose, which is making a contribution. What you see more and more uh, is the rise of the purpose motive. People uh, can become disengaged and demotivated at work if they don't understand or, or they cannot invest in the bigger picture. Um, and more and more organizations want some kind of transcendent purpose, partly because it makes coming to work better, and partly because uh, that's the way to get better talent. Uh, what we're now seeing is that uh, when the profit motive becomes unmoored from the purpose motive, bad things happen. Ethically, sometimes, but also bad things like bad products, bad services, uninspiring places to work. Uh, when the profit motive is paramount, when it becomes completely unhitched from the purpose motive, Motive, people don't do great things. And the companies that are flourishing, uh, profit, not for profit, somewhere in between, are animated by this purpose motive. For example, the motto of Skype, uh, the founder of Skype says something like, our goal is to uh, be disruptive, but in the cause of making the world a better place. Pretty good purpose. That's the kind of thing that might get you up racing to go to work. 
So the science shows that we care deeply about a bigger purpose, uh, the impact that our work has on others, that we care about mastery very deeply, and that we want to be self-directed. I think that the big takeaway here is that if we get past our uh, ideology of carrot and stick and look at the science, we can build organizations and work lives that makes us better off. And they also have the promise to make our world just a little bit better. So I want to close with um, tips on how we can apply the principles of uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose to the workplace, and how we can help uh, people view their work as a calling or craft their jobs to align them with their interests and their passions. Um, let's start with autonomy. We all want to be free, and we all want to be able to express that freedom in meaningful ways. Um, and science suggests that autonomy comes when employees feel like they have a sense of choice on the job. So how can you create that uh, in the workplace? Give employees opportunities to make their own choices. Related to this, offer flexibility on how and when a task is performed. Uh, provide a rationale um, when tasks are presented. Even more important than doing things, than being productive, is understanding the reasons why you are doing them. In most cases, the why is, is what fuels the doing. Uh, research shows that when people are given a compelling reason to do something, a strong why, they expend more effort towards their goal and they view their contributions as more meaningful. Number four, minimize the focus on rewards. When employees are only rewarded for their successes, for the things that they do well, they tend to stick to the routines that they've been rewarded for and very rarely try new approaches. And without trying new things, uh, your business will slowly but surely be eclipsed by competitors. So instead, encourage your employees when they attempt new things and reward them for trying. It's a, it's a great way to spark creativity in the workplace. The obvious risk is that this may lead to failure, but I think that's good. Failure is a catalyst for growth and innovation. Number five is give your employees options as to where to do the, their work. The impact of work environment on work performance is underestimated. Giving your employees the option to work from home or work from the coffee shop or from the library, um, it can be just what they need to get their creative juices flowing again and for them to identify where they work best, where they are most productive. Number six is allow them to have a say in the creation of the workplace itself. Give your employees an opportunity to influence the shaping of the workplace, uh, what's in it, how things are placed, uh, how it looks. They will feel more invested in it. Um, the last one is delegate tasks to your employees and make them in charge of the tasks. Again, playing on this concept of authorship and ownership and autonomy. So in the same vein, um, how can businesses facilitate job crafting? Uh, a common business practice is the exit interview. When an employee uh, leaves, you sit down with them and discuss the reasons why they left and then try to use that knowledge uh, for the future. But this is backwards thinking. Why not do entry interviews? When new people join, sit down with them in their first week to find out what their favorite projects have been in the past, uh, what aspirations they have for the future, uh, which leads to job crafting. Um, by doing entry interviews, you can begin working with them to craft their jobs in ways that align with your goals as well as with theirs. If you're an employee, you can initiate this conversation yourself. Ask your manager for advice on how you can incorporate your strengths into your job or how you can develop new skills that you're interested in developing. How basically can you make the job you want one that is good for the organization? And another exercise that may be useful is to do job crafting swap meetings where you bring a group, a group of employees that work together in, in the organization and um, have them go through the tasks that they enjoy and those that they don't enjoy, that, that they don't like. If I really enjoy um, client meetings because I am not uh, comfortable in them or because I just I don't think that I'm particularly useful in client meetings but another member of the team loves client meetings and would love to maybe take the meetings that I'm responsible for for a while I would perhaps uh, love to do more uh, report writing or whatever the case may be 
So swapping uh, tasks and duties, the potential drop, uh, drawback here is uh, that there may be some activity that ends up in the center of the table that no one wants to be doing as much. And then the organization or the manager needs to think about a way to handle that. Does that become something that then is more equitably distributed so that everyone knows that you know, they all have some portion of this, or perhaps there's a way to take that outside of the organization, depending on what those types of tasks may be. The point is that job crafting is something that can be done collectively with your manager, with your group, with your uh, work with coworkers as a group. It's not only something individual. How to foster mastery in the workplace. Um, Giving immediate feedback, it's, it's uh, important. Letting your employees know how they are performing and how they can improve, it's an absolutely essential part of motivation to receive feedback. And similar to this, recognize your employees for their work and not just any type of recognition. The best type of recognition is one that is given immediately, one that is specific, one that complements the behavior rather than the person, and one that is made publicly as opposed to privately. Number three is uh, provide opportunities for growth, challenge, and learning. And, and related to this, empower your employees to find new challenges, to master. Any tasks, uh, ta task that is continuously repeated uh, stops engaging the mind after a while. To keep your employees engaged, Propose a new challenge or let them come up or with one themselves. Task uh, variety, how varied in terms of tasks our jobs are, is one of the strongest predictors of job satisfaction. And finally, how to foster a sense of purpose. Um, we feel a sense of purpose and mission when we feel that we're making an impact on other people's lives. Um, so team, team building uh, is essential because our work normally impacts our team members a lot. So make sure that all employees understand the broader mission, the big picture. Uh, workers want to work towards something that matters. When your employees um, believe in what your company is building, they will be more productive, they will work harder, they will complain less, they will be more fully engaged. Number two is create an onboarding process which involves other co-workers so as to foster friendship. And similar to this, offer non-work activities that allow colleagues to collaborate through common goals. Are your co-workers not meshing? Try away days or off-sites. Um, most away days are a little bit of a disaster, but they are interesting enough in that they are trying to reveal your co-workers as humans. And the reason is that, you know, in order to get work done, the more you can see your fellow humans in the round, the more you will uh, deploy resources of compassion, sympathy, understanding, empathy. It is very helpful if during an away day, you discover that your colleague is uh, getting divorced. Uh, that's a very vital piece of information that you need to know when you're doing some reports on them. And these are going to be the moments where we interact with each other as human beings, where we connect, we forge, we sync uh, with each other. Because if you don't understand uh, people's context, uh, you can make attributions and they are often negative attributions about what other people are doing, whether they're working hard enough, whether they are distracted. Um, and these attributions are often not really fair uh, because you don't really get what their situation is in the same way as you would if you were working face to face. Um, there's evidence that when we gain um, this kind of personal knowledge about our colleagues' uh, lives uh, outside of work, it humanizes them. We feel more similar to them. We trust them more. Um, if we only talk about work, we miss out on that information. Um, so a uh, final tip, build uh, shared spaces that create opportunities for coworkers to bond, even when they're not talking about work. So to recap, I've talked about the psychology of vocation and calling. I've gone through unhelpful myths we have about calling, the dark and bright sides of calling, the quest to find your element. I've also discussed the concept of job crafting, and I've spent some time uh, talking about the science of motivation and engagement, what gets us up in the morning. I've also gone through some tips and tricks for businesses to apply the research uh, to organizations. And uh, now I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. And over.
over to Jim. Wow, that was fantastic, Clara. Well done. Um, absolutely fantastic. Um, great to see that was a great journey, actually, listening to your presentation and uh, uh, the tips at the end were just brilliant. And to quote John Adams in the chat, uh, this could be a great TED talk to the masses. Uh, so uh, very, very, very kind, very good words there and very well received. The chat was um, alive through the, through the talk.